We're rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Song? Yeah. Word. All right, this is D-Formalities, D-Formalities.com. And we're here at, what's the, what's the name of the studio? Mission Sound Th- Studios? This is Mission Sound in Williamsburg. Mission yeah. Sound Studios in Williamsburg. Nice. With Basie Bob, Grammy Award winning mixing engineer, Basie Bob. I got Lenny in the building with me, Cramp. That's good. Producer, beat maker. Producer, beat maker. Trumpet right. player. Trump, definitely Trump player. We're going to get into Just, that. The man of all <laughs> trades right here. Is there oh, anything yeah. you don't want us to ask you? Just to clarify. Um, well, yeah, probably that child molestation case was like, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm, I'm I'd no rather not talk about case. that. Okay. Anything else is pretty much open game. Word. Say whatever you want. Hell yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Me cool. casa su casa. Break it out. Cool, cool. <laughs> I like the space though. I like the space here and what you're doing here. You, uh, this is dope. You, you have a question? You want to start it off first, Cram? Nah, you start it off. Me? What's a typical day for you? Because you're working my dream job right now. I know you said that the other I day. I said that the other day. <laughs> yeah, this is dope as hell. Yeah. Well, working it, my it's, dream job. It's, it, um, it varies because actually my job has changed a lot. Okay. It's changed tremendously in the last five or six years. Mm-hmm. Um, for about 20 years, like, you know, my typical day was I went in and, you know, I would I would get a record from a label and I would mix it or I would produce it or be recording vocals or posting stuff or, you know, it was almost exclusively working for the majors and now I've shifted into almost exclusively working with independent artists because that's really where the industry's gone. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm still, I'm still freelance, you know, producing and mixing records for clients but I also have a, a licensing and publishing company called Basie Bob Music and okay. um, basically I, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time trying to prepare tracks that I'm I'm producing and tracks that I'm mixing for film and television so okay. that's kind nice. of like a big transition that I've made and then I have a um, an educational thing that I do for young producers and mixers called Elements of Mixing and yeah. I do that here uh, once a month that was actually what I was doing on, on Sunday but a typical day like what when you like from getting up, the in, the morning, up in the morning to, at, to when you're ready to go back to bed so like including at, including at the crib like all the way yeah, like, to, uh, what do you all, do all because this is what I, I want to do well so um, what like when you wake up so my, you, you know my like, job involves a lot of communication so okay. you know I spend about two hours reading blogs and returning emails and you know tweeting checking Facebook you know just doing all the typical kind of social business stuff okay and I usually do that between, you know, 9 and 11. And then uh, I'm a Buddhist, so I chant in the morning. Nice. Chant nam myoho renge kyo for about 45 minutes. And then, um, you know, I, I either fix myself some lunch or sometimes I grab lunch on the way. Yeah, I usually start here around 1 o'clock. And, you know, I work anywhere from like 8 to 12 hours, depending on what it is. And, I mean, if it's a production, then I've got maybe, you know, I mean, I, they're multiple artists that are in midst of finishing their records yeah. right now so you know like yesterday I was doing vocals with this young sort of Michael Jackson sounding Latino kid named Sebastian Rivera I've been working on his record okay. for two months now so you know he'll be coming in and doing vocals maybe his his guy that he that he hangs with will be doing background vocals maybe I'll be doing some programming um, you know it's it's really um, you know, like I arrive at the studio, I try to start getting things organized, and I start sort of just trying to prepare the session for the day. Like, yeah. you know, it's usually one song that I'm working on in the day. In some cases, you know, I might be at the end of a project, and I might have five songs done, or seven songs done, or in the case of an album, ten songs done, and, and I'm, I'm tweaking them, and I'm trying to get them ready for mastering. Okay. So, um, and then, you know, sometimes I'm just doing, like, admin stuff for the publishing company, you know, like I'm sifting through you know, tracks and files, that, you know, I mean, I have 13 different writers that I'm working with, and they're, they're all artists, they're all recording artists that do anything from beats to singer-songwriter stuff to rock bands to whatever, and they're all making music, and then I'm processing that music and checking it and making sure that it sounds right, and okay. it's ready to go to the next go to the next step. Yeah. It's, a whole, cool. it's a whole lot. Um, it's a process. <laughs> like, I, you, you don't have an assistant? Anyone helps you? I have yeah. had many assistants, and I lose them all, un- wow. unfortunately. It's too much. It's, <laughs> well, a lot to, it's a lot to handle. It's not because they can't handle it. It's, it's because I can't afford to pay them. Yeah. You know, it's oh, unfortunately okay. just the economics of the business have changed so much. You know, yeah. like when I first moved to the city, you know, like a lockout in the studio was 2500 a day, you know? Yeah. Mm. Now I rent the studio for 400 a day, you know? You have I, to have money I, to record. I used that. to make 4000 a day 10 years ago to mix a single, 
You know, wow. now I make a thousand to mix a single. Sometimes seven fifty. Sometimes wow. two fifty if it's for a friend, and they don't. You know, they're paying out of their pocket. And they're working a job. You know, in a restaurant or a retail job, and yeah. you know, so I mean, pretty much everybody's funding their own records now. So we're yeah. kind of like living within this DIY universe, and I, and I'm trying to figure out well, you know, how can I maximize the value for the people that I'm working with. Nice. And initially, the way I would maximize the value is to, is to make a great record for them, to produce a great record for them, you know, and generally speaking with independent records, by the time you finish the record and you've put in hundreds of hours, you know, you're, you're down to like $7.15, so I might as well work at Walmart. <laughs> but, but if you love it, and that's what you love doing, then you just keep doing it, just you know, going. regardless Definitely. of, you know, I mean, it was great when I was making, you know, loads of money doing it for the majors, but I mean, you know, those kind of gigs are few and far between, really. Yeah. It's very, very rare these days. So, um, so that's why I started the licensing company. You know, the licensing company is a way to try to bring more notoriety to the music. You know, for the for the artists that I'm working and with. What's the name of that? So everybody knows. It's called Big Bottom Music. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's Big Bottom Music. It's at Big Bottom Music on Twitter. So you know, I mean, if you, if you connect with bands and they're looking to produce records and try to get it out there, you know, and we actually people. just got um. We got um, um, the interview we're doing with um, this, the trio we have, Smoky Illusion. Oh, oh is, yeah, that yeah. A, is that a rap trio? No, uh, it's... Um, they're not a trio. It's, it's it, one guy, I guess. Cramp. You sure? <laughs> yeah. Because through throughout the whole, it was there. Don't trio. give away our next interviews. Man. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, I, mean, I mean, they could they could be listening to this. And yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. You, you uh, um, yeah, speak about the industry. Like, how'd you get into it? Was it like freelance? Did yeah, when you go did to school? it? I, I want to know when did it start? When was your like? When did you did you go to school for like? Did you want well, to I was uh, I was I was a bit of a math whiz in high school. You know, I was doing like college calculus in high school, so I was sort of on the track to become an engineer. And I went to University of Virginia, and I was there for a year. And and I had been really serious about music all the way through junior high school and high school. And um. It was, you know, it was always my passion, but, you know, my parents were always like, you know, I don't think that they knew that there was a big industry out there yeah. that you, generated $12 billion a year. I think that they just <laughs> thought that, you know, I would be, you know, broke my whole life, you know, trying to work in the music business. And at that time, it was not my intention to be a mixer or a producer. It was my intention to be Wynton Marcellus. I mean, I was a jazz trumpet player growing up. So... um did you just play trumpet? How many instruments? Did trumpet you play? and bass. Um, I, I started out at trumpet when I was five, and then I picked up bass when I was 12, and um, I still played trumpet pretty much through college. But anyway, long story short, I transferred after a year from UVA to University of Miami in 1981, and that they had just started a, uh, a music engineering program. It was one of the first in the country. Yeah. And I got a full scholarship. I got a full ride to UM. So nice. the first day I got to UM, the guidance counselor Connie Weldon, you know, she was looking at my transcript. She said, you've got two years of college calculus here. Have you ever thought about music engineering? Yeah. I was like, well, what's music engineering? She's like, you know, it's the guy that twists the knobs in the studio. I was like, fuck yeah, I'd love to do that. You know? <laughs> so I ended up ultimately doing a double major um, at UM, which was very hard. It was rough. I, you know, I was doing engineering classes, electrical engineering classes on the other side of the campus, and I was also in the big band doing the composition, all the regular music stuff. Wow. Um, in the music department and I think within the first six months I got to school I pretty much found my footing you know I was doing recitals I mean everything from classical piano to little you know little jazz groups to rock bands to big bands to full orchestra stuff and I, and I continued to do that and there was a uh, a studio up at the top of Gusman Hall which was the big concert hall at UM and you could rent the studio if you signed up for it from 11 p.m. I think until 7 a.m. so there were eight hours at night and I didn't make it to class much I just kind of <laughs> went to the studio <laughs> and I mean I you know and and you know like all the guys that I was in in college with I mean a lot of them are ultimately the guys that ended up producing all the Miami Sound Machine stuff you know nice. George Casas and Clay Oswald and John DeFaria all the original Miami Sound Machine guys were, were my classmates I recorded all their senior recitals and and they were already well into the production process and actually Gloria was already starting to work with them when they were still in college this yeah. is like right around the time that Conga came out like 19 let's say 1983 1984 so I was kind of around that scene and um, I did a I did an internship 
for a month in Los Angeles, I think after my first year at UM. And I worked at Ocean Way, you know, Allen Side Studio. I worked at Motown Studios. I worked at the record plant. You know, Rose Mann was was running the record plant back then. She's still running the record plant now, you know, Sick. 30 years later. And um, yeah, I mean, I met Rose when I was like 19 or 20 years old. And then um, and then I went to New York, I think, the, the next fall for an AAS convention, Audio Engineering Society. Yeah, they I've gave been, us like I've been a, to one of those. Yeah, so they gave us they gave us like discount plane tickets for anybody at the, in the engineering school to go. Yeah. And I just remember like standing outside the Hilton Hotel and there were all these vendors like selling hot dogs and food and we were just like <laughs> sitting out on the stoop with like every you went to other the one over here and, and Yeah, fifty like, first street and sixth yeah, Avenue yeah. and I just was sitting out there and I was like, This is it, man. This is where I want to be and I knew this when I was nineteen, yeah. you know, and then I I mean I graduated I guess two years later, I was twenty one. And uh I sent out about hundred and forty letters, I moved to the city and uh, was staying with my girlfriend. I hadn't actually found a, a place yet. And, you know, I must have interviewed at, a, I don't know, about 25 studios. I mean, the Power Station, the Hit Factory, Sony, Clinton, like all the big studios in Midtown. And they were all basically offering me the same thing, which was subway fare, you know, which was like <laughs> 10 or 15 bucks a week, basically, yeah. to just get to work and back. There was no salary wow. until you, you know, interned for a year. Yeah. And I had like 50 bucks and I was like really freaking out, you know, like nobody was going to pay me. That's crazy. So I remember uh, opening the Yellow Pages and looking for recording studios in Brooklyn. I thought, well, I'll just roll the dice. Maybe somebody will give me an interview. And um, I reached this one studio, Ralston Recording, and uh, this guy named Achille Walker, who's still like my best friend to this day after 30 years in the business. And He's like, yeah, man, come on over. And so, I, you know, I was staying with my girlfriend up in Harlem. I take the A train all the way out to Fulton and Nostra. Wow. It was like an hour and a half plane ride, uh, train, train ride, yeah. And I get in there, and he just looks at me, and he's like, white boy, what the fuck are you doing here? I mean, this was like <laughs> bed in like yeah. 1984, you know? I mean, there's like crack files everywhere. There's people lying in the street, burned out buildings up and down the block. I mean, it's no, that's nothing like what bed is now. No, no, know? no. no. That's crazy. Not. I mean, it was really like the B-boy 80s. It was rough, you know? There were still hookers walking down 42nd <laughs> Street. You know, it was just a different New York. There was garbage everywhere. It's, New York is not like that Definitely. now, but it was then. It was grimy, you know? Zombie land. <laughs> and uh, and I was practically crying. I mean, I didn't quite break down, but I was yeah. definitely like I was on my last legs. I had you know I was praying on the train. I've got to get this job. Just yeah. somebody, just give me a paycheck, you know. And I just I just stepped up to him and I said, Listen, man, I I'll do anything, you know. I'll do anything to help you out, you know. I'll I'll stay here. I'll sleep here. I'll work as many hours as you want. I just need a job. I don't want to leave New York, you know. Yeah. He said he said Well, you know, you got a lot of you got a lot of fucking guts, you know, to come to this neighborhood as a white kid. You know, he'd never seen any white people in the studio ever. Wow. It was a Caribbean studio, really, but I mean, that was what, where. What were they recording there? They were recording like uh, Jimmy Cliff and Lady okay. Complainer and Sparrow and all these Caribbean artists from Trinidad and Jamaica. Because yeah. Charlie Ralston, who owned the studio, was a big empresario. He had all of the artists for all of the big Caribbean festivals. Okay. You know, at festival time. Yeah. And he had a store downstairs called Charlie Records. Okay, and he made all the records that. upstairs in the studio. And the studio's still there. Yeah. Fulton and Nostra. And so I started working as an assistant, well, not an even assistant, like an intern, kind of a gopher. And like the third day I was there, this guy with an eye patch and like his friend walk in, and it's Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh, and it's the show, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I mean, I'm sitting in the back of the room, and there's like, you know, one guy with these huge lips, like making beats with his mouth, yeah. and another guy with an eye patch and a British accent telling stories, and Sick. I just was like, wow, what's going on? What here? the fuck is this, <laughs> you know? And I was a little, I was a little arrogant. I was really kind of like, who are these ignorant kids, you know? Yeah. Like, what are they doing, you know? Because I had been so indoctrinated into the jazz the jazz world the jazz world the educational system that I was kind of an elitist you know I thought that like people that didn't know how to read music were ignorant you know and oh, okay. that was my ignorance yeah. you know but I mean I, I very very quickly got schooled I mean you know like a couple weeks later Melly Mel and the Furious Five came in and mm, that's nice. how I got to know Africa Islam and Melly Mel and uh, and Grandmaster Flash who I ultimately ended up doing a record with maybe a year later wow. called Bada Boom Bang the Fat Boys were in. Uh, Run DMC Fat came boys. in. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was really I like, you know, I, I worked on, you know, I worked on Curtis Blow sessions, like, I worked on Strafe, set it off. So you were you know, there just from the beginning. The beginning, well, beginning. I mean, I wouldn't say it was the beginning, but I mean, it wasn't even called hip hop at that point. It was, was just called, it was called rap music, yeah, just you know, rap. it was just rapping, yeah. you know, yeah. rapping over, and, and a lot of times rapping over live beats, like, like Sugar Hill Gang kind yeah. of stuff, you know, it was kind of, samplers didn't exist. I mean, it's crazy, you know, like Hank Shockley was sitting right where you were sitting like three days that's, ago. He came to my seminar. It's going to give me, like... <laughs> and, and, I remember, and I remember when I first met Hank and oh, Keith, shit. you know, and like they yeah. had this whole system where like Hank would, sit, you know, sit to the left of the console with his crate and his records and his headphones and Keith would sit on the other side Doing and they would run the beat and they would drop the records yeah. the same way you do it in a club you know they would just loop back and loop they would just back. cut them because the engineers forth. were making making the beats at that point well they, i mean i, I they mean would the, find the, the samples cause the I, dj's were making the beats the dj's know? yeah but they would give it because the engineer knew how to record it they didn't know really how to no these that. guys didn't know anything about recording but so, they were they were really good at like picking, picking the, out interesting kinds of stuff and yeah. There's just something incredibly beautiful about the non-linearity of, of hip-hop, you know, that you would have some kind of, like, shaker from a country-western record, you know, or a snare drum from a country-western record yeah. with, like, a classic, you know, James Brown beat. There's me with James when with I was James on the Brown. road. Oh, yeah, yeah, with Brooklyn Funk Essentials back in the 90s. That's so uh, dope. God bless James Brown, man. He taught oh, me yeah. a lot about music. Anyway, um, so that was kind of, like, how it, how it began. And then, you know, there was just... Um, it's kind of like a C.S. Lewis book, you know. There were just a couple of like extraordinary circumstances that happened. Yeah. You know, um, you know, one was uh, was with Gwen Guthrie. I don't know if you ever heard that song. Ain't nothing going on but the rent. Oh yeah. I've but heard uh, that. I was Definitely. working. I was actually cutting tape. Now at this point, I'd kind of started assisting at soundtrack because soundtrack had just. You ever cut tape like? Oh yeah, half inch tape. That's, yeah, and that's and like the worst. and you know we used to like we would take like from the to, kick to the snare. You have to cut the tape. We would take the tape and lay it across. Yeah, like the, what you do in Pro Tools, how you cut it from here to there. They did that. With we would tape. slice it with a blade. Yeah, <laughs> with the and blades. so you would you would mark the kick and the snare right with a piece of 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 white pencil. Yeah. On the leather on the top of the tape machine, and yeah. so you knew that was a beat, and so you would just kind of like guesstimate like in the middle, that's a half beat. And then you would two, put two more marks, and that would be like quarter beats, yeah. you know. And then you would like tape it or glue it together, right? Yeah, well, you would use this blue tape, yeah, and you would and you would rub you would, it. You would rub, rub it on top it's, of the thing. But I mean, like so all the tedious. all the early like Latin rascal stuff, you know, Tuta Aquino stuff that was happening in the '80s, all this kind of stutter edits and extended mixes and stuff. Yeah. This was all done with two tape machines. Yeah. They would start with the master, and then they would, you know, if they would want to go, they would just record it. Yeah. over and over again in parts and then they would cut the parts and then they'd move them over to the first tape machine huh. and stick them together <laughs> and that's where stutter edits came from you know they were tape that's edits good. really it started out that way wow. so anyway so that's I was working sick. with this guy Ron Banks and he was working with Gwen Guthrie and Ron had to go to Los Angeles for a couple months I think to make a record and he put me in charge of Pitt Conley who was the guy from Surface you know who ultimately wrote all the hits yeah. For surface and he was working with Gwen Guthrie on the song Ain't Nothing Going On But The Rent and he said to me Brock you know how to use this SSL console <laughs> and I was like yeah I, I know all about it so what the hell is that <laughs> <laughs> hold on one second it's cool it's cool we're um, gonna take a break anyway let's we're gonna take a, take a break anyway let's anyway. take a break and then we'll come back with more yeah, so we'll come back around. to Debbie Gibson and Gwen Guthrie that's basically how I started my yeah, career that's word. Word. All right, he's gonna answer his rotary phone <laughs>
Stick to the code, you murky water. Bomber clad, brass clad, blood clad, and every kind of clad you can see. Yeah, I know. Rob that bitch, rob that bitch, rob that bitch, rob that bitch, rob that bitch.
My watch is so big you can see it from me parking lot. You know me, I'm just looking for tassels. <laughs> Formalities, deformalities.com. Make sure to follow us on iTunes, all right? It's very important. iTunes, deformalities. Follow us there. You can subscribe and get all the episodes you need. So, Bob, we went through tape splicing and your whole history. You have a question, Lenny? Before yeah. I get into um, some of my deep. How do you feel version? about the new school way of making music as opposed to the old school? Do you miss, like, do you get nostalgic about the tape cutting and, like, Nah, nah. I, I, I'm not. I'm not nostalgic about any particular kind of, you know, any particular kind of mode of recording. You know, I mean, for me, it doesn't matter whether it's a USB mic going into a laptop and in somebody's room, which I've done loads of times just in the last year. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, you know, I happen to have a mix room in like one of the best recording rooms in the city. Yeah. One of the best remaining recording rooms is this amazing Neve Studio. You know, Mission Sound. Okay. next door but ultimately i think that the thing that's that is most precious is creativity yeah, yeah. Definitely. you know and i mean even in the dawn of hip-hop you know i mean guys were just expressing incredible amounts of creativity you know so you know i mean ultimately um you, you really never know what what's going to happen i mean uh in 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 both of these cases in the, uh, the debbie gibson record only in my dreams and the gwen guthrie record you know both of which were number one singles I just got kind of thrust into it, you know? Yeah. I mean, literally, like, if Pick had said to me, you know, do you know how to use the SSL? I'd be like, no, I don't have a fucking idea how to use the <laughs> SSL, which was the truth. I lied and said, no, I know all about the SSL. He's like, okay, you can handle it, right? I was like, yeah, I can handle it, you know? So I got kind of bumped up, you know, from like an intern to a mixer, okay. like in one day. 
and they just assigned a, an assistant who had been there for years and who knew all about the, the SSL. Board. Yeah, so, so I was just like, so, so what's this thing do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had kind of a vague idea of yeah, like... But you, you know, didn't know the patch board or anything like I that. I just right? didn't, yeah, I mean, I just didn't know that particular desk. And then there were, uh, there were a lot of uh, specific vagaries about the SSL, like any console that just takes a while to get the yes. hang of, you know. Yeah. But ultimately, I mixed that song for pick and... Um, much to my surprise, it was like a number one 12 inch, you know, within a couple months. And same thing happened with Debbie Gibson. Um, I just, I mixed a demo for her producer, Fred Zarr, who had a studio in his mother's house down in Avenue U in Brooklyn. And I used to go there every weekend and work for him. And he had just the worst singers coming in, you know, like for <laughs> months and months and months, just like terrible songs, terrible singers. I just thought, I can't believe this. Like, this is not going to amount to anything. <laughs> And then one day he called me and he said, I got this 14 year old girl and she's written like 500 songs and she's got a perfect pitch and she's got a development deal on Atlantic. Can you do a, a demo mix for $50? Okay. And so I went over to his house on Saturday afternoon. I had a day off and mixed, you know, I just, just whipped something together for yeah. him on the console. And then um, about three months later, I was at dinner with my roommate in the West Village at the Corner Bistro where we used to go to get burgers and there was a jukebox in there and the song comes on on the jukebox. And I looked at and Graham and I was song. like, man, I, I think I recognize this song. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I went over to the jukebox and I looked at the little label and it was like, Debbie Gibson, Only in My Dreams. And I had yeah. done this thing with the mix where I had put it through an SPX-80 so the clap was going like, <laughs> it was like panning from the left to the right. And fuck if I'm not standing in front of the jukebox and I hear my clap panning from the left to the right. And I was like, <laughs> I called up Fred. I was like, Fred, is is there a release of the Debbie Gibson? He's like, oh, yeah, Bob, it's a big hit on the Billboard charts. I was like, what are the Billboard charts? <laughs> He's like, go get one on the newsstand. It's like number four on the Hot 100. I was like, shit, you know. So I was really kind of a hayseed. I didn't really know anything about the business, yeah, you know. You but I kind of, I, I, I just, I was just kind of just trying to swim through it, you know. Yeah. This is like a country boy coming to New York City. It was, you know, it, it happened very, very quickly. And I mean, most people they have a fairly long trajectory before anybody ever like gives them a shot on a mix you know like they assist for years at the power station or places like oh, yeah. that so they get to where they really like know a lot more than i know you know <laughs> i mean i was really kind of um i was very inexperienced as far as like a lot of the technicalities but i felt like i had kind of an instinct you know about yeah. what to do with a record possibly and so i just you know i mean i was really just going on inspiration and perspiration the first 10 years I didn't, had no idea what I was doing that's what yeah. I, I love I love like those kind of stories where it's like all chance and like risk yeah you took a lot of you took that chance with that $50 coming all the way down here but it's like a lot of people know a lot of people you know certain people to get in the game and sure yeah they, they they have they friends on the inside yeah. You had no one. I had no friends. Well, I, I had a couple of friends. I mean, I had I had Graham Hawthorne, who was my college roommate, who had been here three months before I had. Yeah. And he he was already you know he'd already set himself up with an apartment. And um, but as far as uh, the job, the, the I didn't. No, I mean, I didn't. I didn't personally know anybody in the no. studio business or the record business. I didn't even really know what the record business was, to be honest. Right. You know, I mean, I was really green. And I remember, um, I don't know. This was about. This is a couple of months after I worked with Prince, who I also worked with pretty early on. Prince? Yeah, because Eloise uh, Bryan, who who was, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry. This is just, this is a lot. This is a lot to take in. So I, at the same time, I was also starting to work at this fledgling studio, Chung King, you know, yeah, which, Chung was, King, yeah. which was inside a cookie factory on Center Street. This is way that's the old one. That's the, the old Chung, Chung King. King. Yeah. yeah, this is where like the Beastie Boys and Rick yeah. Rubin started with like Run DMC and all that stuff. And uh, Eloise Bryan was the studio manager, and she was from Minnesota, and she grew up with Prince. Wow. She was friends with Prince. I think she was in Purple Rain, actually. She was, like, in the audience for that, that movie. That sounds... Anyway, her boyfriend, Sal, oh, yeah. had, was used to be the chief tech at Electric Lady, and Prince clipped him to take him to Minneapolis okay. to build Paisley Park, which, if you look at the, at the design of Studio A, it's like... Amazing. It's a carbon copy of Studio A at Electric Lady. He just wanted his studio to be just like Hendrix. You know, okay. that was his thing. So uh, occasionally, you know, I mean, Sal and Eloise talked all the day. And Eloise had kind of spied me because I was hanging out at Chung King a lot. And I was doing early kind of like a lot of hip hop yeah. stuff. And I guess Prince was looking for some New York mixers because he wanted a little bit more rugged sound than the typical L.A. mixers. Yeah. Who he thought were softer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we all know they are, 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, good. so she's like, um, yeah, do you want to work for Prince? I was, and, you know, it's just, it's insane. I mean, because, like, I was obsessed with Prince. You yeah. know, like, when I first came out of college, you know, like, I don't know, you know, like, you know, Dirty Mind and you know, Purple Rain and ultimately Sign of the Times. I mean, I had transcribed, like, every lick of, like, everything that he'd ever written. I mean, I was obsessed with Prince. Like, he was, yeah. like, to me, he was, like, the greatest artist of all time. He'd really, like... You know what I mean? He was, like... He was, he, just he was at the pantheon <laughs> of, of greatness. You know, he's a great guitar player, lyrically amazing, melodically amazing, like, really spiritually gifted in terms of being able to move people emotionally. She's like, yeah, um... He needs somebody to come help him with his new record, Love Sexy, which was the record that he oh, followed wow. with right after um, Sign oh, of the Times. Oh, Sign of the Times. You know, fuck if I wasn't on a plane like two <laughs> days later <laughs> to Chanhassen, Minnesota, you know, like staying in a log cabin out in the middle of the snow. That's crazy. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just weird how stuff like that happens. I mean, I feel a little bit sad about the general kind of millennial economy, you know, because it just seems like when I came into the business in the late 80s, I mean, maybe there were just a lot of opportunities for me, but I mean, it just felt like there were a lot of opportunities for everyone, for everyone. to get on. I mean, if you were yeah. if you were talented and you had some pizzazz and you had a little bit of a personality, you know, you could usually like flip that into getting on into something. Getting on. And there I were mean, if, so it was many all about fucking talent. records. It was about talent more so back then. then now it's about how many people you're fo is following you. you know. and, yeah. So it's about it's high a, school, basically. It's about numbers. It's, <laughs> it's a game of socializing. It's a game of numbers right now. It's like how 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 many followers you have on Twitter, how many followers YouTube, you have, how many Instagram. views you have on YouTube. Like it's it's stupid. It's minuscule and it's it like doesn't. It's also it doesn't also, represent the art that you're making. No, and it's also the case that like probably like most of the people who have made the, you know, the greatest contributions to, you know, American culture and society were not the most popular kids in school. And oh, so yeah. the idea of running an entire industry based on people's personal popularity is fucking it's, insane. It's craziness. It's um, craziness. I have a question. I see you have all these Biggie Platinums here. Um, how did how did you get started with uh, Biggie? I started with Biggie... Um, I started with Puffy, actually. Um, maybe a couple of weeks. How was he to work with, mixing? What? <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, I think Puffy is first and foremost a, a genius marketing guy. Um, you know, he started out as a dancer. He was like dancing with Houdini when he was 14. And he went to Howard University. That's how he met Mark Pitts. That's how he met um, uh, a, a lot of the guys in his camp, like Easy Moby, like yeah. a, lot, a lot of guys he went to college with. Like yeah. they were basically all kind of the same age. And um, he was like a junior A&R guy at Uptown. Uh, yeah. And you know, ultimately, um, I guess he, he sort of upstaged himself a little bit and the boss, you know, punched him in the face and kicked him <laughs> to the curb and told him, you know, you'll never work in this business again, which, I mean, yeah. I had somebody tell me that, you know, when I first moved to the city because I wouldn't take a kickback, but that's another story for another day. Um, so, yeah, he was... Uh, what was it like working with him? Like what uh, happened? Then, I mean, It was really exciting. Fun. I mean, you know, um, Puffy was doing a lot of work at Soundtrack at that time, and he was just, um, he had just started Bad Boy Productions. This is before the label. Um, I'm telling you, it was fun then. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it's, um, I worked on the 411 remix uh, with Big E and Mary J. Um, they had done, they had, I think that there were a couple. Uh, did you, did there you? were a couple remixes that Jodeci were working on because Jodeci yeah. were also on Uptown, and Biggie was on Uptown, and Mary was on Uptown. Yeah, and and um, well, he had si he signed Craig Mack. Actually, was the first artist he signed to Bad yeah. Boy before yeah. he got Biggie over. Yeah, but he managed to do a deal. I it was mean, the I, Big Mac. Was the, the it was the deal. it was the big it was the Big Mac marketing campaign. Yeah, yeah. and they had the they had like the the, the box the McDonald's. They had the McDonald's Big box Mac. with like Biggie and Craig yeah. on it. Yeah, and that was also the tour. It was the Big Mac promotional tour, yeah. which so, happened that but year. Did you know it was going to be that big? Oh no, I had no idea. I mean, I I, I think the the first session I did with Biggie was Things Don't Change, which was never a single, um, but which is an amazing record. Definitely. You know, I mean, like I don't know, man. It just like. It was an echo almost to an earlier era of hip hop, yeah. you know, because it was because it was a sample of an earlier hip hop record, you know. But I think that um, I think that you know, 
I had no idea that any of those acts were going to do what they were going to do. You know, I mean, I worked on Diary of a Mad Band with yeah. uh, Jodeci for six months, I think, at the Hit Factory. And, you know, I worked on the back end of the What's the 411 record. I did some remixes with Biggie and Foxy Brown, I think. And then um, we started My Life, which was Mary's second record, which was, you know, was by that time... Puffy had taken his meeting. I mean, I remember the day like it was yesterday. You know, Puffy in like a Bill Blast suit, you know, pinstripe yeah. suit, you know, like totally decked out. I mean, he looked like an executive. <laughs> and he was 21 years old, you know, and he walked into Clive Davis's office and asked him for $6 million to start a record company. And I mean, this was literally like weeks after Andre Harrell had punched him in the face and told him <laughs> to get the fuck out of Uptown, you know? He was bold. Uh, he he was, bold. was really bold. And, you know, I mean, Puffy's a Scorpio, he has a huge ego, you know, yeah. he's, um, you know, he's a, he's a larger than life kind of personality. I mean, the thing that I appreciate about him is that, you know, he never, uh, he never was willing to accept anything that was okay or was mediocre, you know, yeah. like if he, and he didn't spend much time in the studio, he spent a lot of time in the clubs, he spent a lot of time socializing, he spent a lot That's of time out. Party promoter, really, yeah. you know, like he was already promoting games and parties before so, he even got into the record business. So when you were mixing, he would come in and just... He'll He'd know. pop in at like one o'clock in the morning for like a half an hour. He'd have a listen yeah. to it. And, you know, and he'd be like, either it's amazing or, you know, or I'm not feeling this at all. Like, yeah. what the fuck are you guys doing here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I remember one time, I can't remember, what it, what it was like, um, it was a Faith Evans record or something, but... I had been locked out. I hadn't left the studio in like three days. I'd been there. Wow. No, 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 no. It was this. In, it was these interludes. I wrote a whole bunch of the musical interludes, which I never got credited for, never got publishing or songwriting or anything. I, got, I think I got a keyboard credit, but they were all these like musical interludes for my life. You know, okay. like you know, the ride in the car, yeah, Puffy's yeah. calling Mary, and blah blah blah. And he was like, "Make it like a movie," you know. So I was writing some <laughs> like string film soundtrack kind of stuff, you know, and. Uh, and I was just, I was so fucking exhausted. I just hadn't really had a good night's sleep in three days. It was like 3.30 in the morning and Puffy comes rolling in with like his whole crew with like a fur coat on, you know. ready to keep working. Yeah, and he comes in and I'm like, and I've been slaving on this track for like 72 hours, you know. And he just turns and he just like ramps it right up to 10, you know. And he like listens to it and he just stops taping. He's like, damn, I did it again. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you did it again, you know. But, you know, I guess that's... Uh, I guess that's just, you know, that's what you... You know, you have to have that... You have to have that thick skin and you have to have that kind of level of belief in yourself that, Definitely. like, like nobody's going to stop you. Yeah. I'm unstoppable, you know. And that was kind of like his whole mantra, you know. He had everybody kind of on that road with him and he was yeah. very, very good. He had a very good eye for talent. He was very good at motivating people to do great things, yeah. you know? He's like, still doing it. Yeah, and he's still doing still it. I mean, he's just fucking... He just tweeted yesterday $700 million for the Clippers, like 15 minutes after the <laughs> announcement, you know? I mean, you know, it's... He's arrived at a position in his life. You know, it's not like he's not still struggling. I mean, he's still trying to make a career for himself as an actor. You know, he's trying to get people... Just yeah. because you're a billionaire doesn't mean that people are going to take you seriously in That's another an world, you know? And yeah. he's kind of conquered the music business. He's conquered the fashion business. He's, you he's know... He's been doing a good job. Actually, he's, he's made a fortune. I I actually, you know, I thought, thought he was quite good in the Joaquin Phoenix movie. I mean, I've seen just about everything that, that Puffy's done on yeah. film. And I, I mean, he tends to play himself... You know, he tends to play a mogul. I mean, what was that movie where he was running the record company uh, with Jonah with Jonah Smith? Yeah, get me to the Greek. Yeah, to the Greek. That might have been his best because he was just yeah. He, he stole. He the was movie just totally him. himself. I mean, <laughs> he's, like, you know, Rick, he's, he's just Jordan. Exactly. <laughs> Kiss me, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh my God. I mean, the funny thing about Puffy is that I. I think one of the reasons I got along so well with him is he was, he's a Scorpio. He's born on the same day as my dad, November 4th, wow. you know, and I was always at his birthday parties. I mean, I was the only white guy at Biggie's funeral, you know, at the Frank Marshall home in the city, you know, after he got killed. And I don't know. It's like I, I felt like everything was a downhill slide after that. It just felt like nothing was the same. Certainly Bad Boy wasn't the same Yeah. after Biggie died, after he got killed. Just How was, uh, how was the tension between... Pac and Biggie, you know, after that it's how was bullshit. I mean I bullshit. I worked with Pac and Biggie together on a song called Welcome to the House of Pain, um yeah. with uh with Stretch Armstrong. Um when 
when Tupac was still living in New York, this was like digital underground era. This is before he moved to California, yeah. got involved with Dre and Suge Knight, and ultimately, you know, um, that whole that whole crew. I mean, I just think it was. There's always been a lot more tension in L.A. Just generally speaking, with the whole gang thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I just did, I never felt that ever. But anywhere I, in New pop. York. A lot of people say that. Oh, no, no, I no, I just mean, I just mean generally, general, general, just, general, just like music business, rappers, everyone was like, hey, what's up? You know, it's just like, I never felt that in New York. And yeah. and I worked in LA a lot, you know, like throughout the I 90s. Mean, the studio, and, the studio is, is a very positive place. And I don't think a lot of the gang violence moves into the studios unless people allow them to because studios is really a creative spot. People just want to. Well, and unless and, you're related, I mean, the thing is, is that the, the whole gang thing, the way I understand it, just sort of like took the place of like the absence of a father figure or the yeah. absence of parental figures. Is like yeah. you need a crew to hang out to give you but security and the, to protect you. I and so people had, yeah. You know, I mean, I remember yeah. when I was working in L.A. I mean, I had friends who, you know, who had, you know, who had gang member friends or family members, you know, that were in the Bloods or the Crips, and it was just kind of a common thing. Yeah. It didn't bleed into the studio that much, yeah. but it was definitely much, much more. A, a visible part of the music business in LA than in New York. I never felt that at all in New York. Yeah, the studio is kind of the neutral p grounds, I think, for people. Because what Riz, I, I listened to an interview with Riza, what he was saying is he would have like members of Wu Tang's from different affiliations. When they came in the studio, it's was, it was just all love, you know. It's all about music, yeah. It's all about the music. It's not I mean, not to say else. that guys didn't bring their guns and like put them on the oh, desk. Definitely. I mean, everybody <laughs> had guns in the '90s. It yeah, was like definitely. you know, Heavy D, Puffy had a gun. You know, Biggie had everybody put their guns down. It was like a <laughs> Western bar, you know, at Daddy's house. <laughs> you it's check ridiculous, your guns. you know. I remember one night, man. They, one of those guys had a bodyguard, this huge guy, you know, and he had a Glock next to him on the couch, you know, and he was drinking a forty and smoking a blunt. I thought, Jesus, man, I hope that. And I didn't realize in those days that you have to actually have to arm a gun before it'll shoot you. But I yeah. just kept thinking, this gun's right behind me, you know. It would blow a <laughs> hole the size of a basketball. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard I thought stories, this guy just yeah. got high and just. <laughs> like tri you know, triggered yeah. by accident. I think that's how a lot of people die. They're I've not really like trying to I've intentionally heard stories kill people. Like engineers being threatened and, and things like that. Oh, I've with a gun. A yeah, I mean, that I never had anything like that. I've heard but. stories like Mob Deep putting a bullet in a council and all that. It's been crazy shit. I worked with Mob Deep. I like those guys, but <laughs> they never threatened me with a gun. But yeah, I guess I was lucky. Yeah. I just knew how to keep low pro, man. I just like I stayed close to the Stay console cool. and I didn't really turn my head around too much. Awesome. Awesome. So, how many Grammys do you have? Like, I have two personal Grammys. Um, okay. One, which is the one there um, for Christina Mi Reflejo, and the other was for uh, Kirk Franklin's gospel record New Nation in 1998. I have about 32 what are called associated Grammys, which yeah. are Grammys where the artists that I was working with, either producing or engineering, won uh, an, an award. And there are. Um, there are two tiers of Grammy Awards, you know. There's the pre-telecast awards, of which there are about 160, which go all the way down to, like, polka and, wow. you know, whatever. You know, Hasidic EDM music or, like, whatever micro-category there is. And then there are the, usually the seven or eight big categories that are telecast. So, yeah. basically, if you were a fly on the wall on a Lauryn Hill record, then you would get a statue, even though maybe you weren't even in the building, you know? Yeah. It's that if you won on television, everybody got a statue, you know? Wow. So, I mean, and that award, the Christina Award, was actually from 9-11. From wow. It, that was the day of the award show. That's and I was on my way to California for the awards, and I got downed in Detroit at, like, 9 o'clock in the morning. I have morning. a question about that Grammy, though. It's, it's a, for a Spanish translation song, right? It's well. It's it's a Latin Grammy. A Latin Grammy. Yeah. But it's a Latin Grammy for a song that was that they also did in English. But it's isn't it for well, the Mulan soundtrack, which is Chinese. Well, the 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 song from uh, from Mulan was called Reflections. That okay. was actually the first song Christina did yeah. with Ron Fair before she got signed uh, to RCA. That was before Genie in a Bottle, and. Um, and yes, part of the idea behind me, Reflejo, which is which is Spanish for reflections, which is the first song, yeah. was that I think we took four TV tracks from the other records that she had done, just okay. basically the whole production, and yeah. just redid them with Spanish lyrics over the top. And then there were um, 
there were seven or eight songs that were original Latin songs. Okay. But the funny thing about that record is that Christina doesn't speak Spanish. Yeah. So, you know, we were in the studio <laughs> for months with... Uh, with Rudy Perez and Mauricio Alboroa, who at that time was the chairman of Laris. So he was like equivalent to Michael Green, okay. but for the Latin American Recording Arts and Society. Okay. And he was a poet, and he was, you know, used to run Warner Brothers Mexico, and he was fluent in Spanish and English. So he was writing the translations okay. of the songs, and Rudy was teaching Christina the songs by ear. Wow. Mi reflejo, you know, like so he she, would... She, Kind of she had no know. idea what she was yeah. singing. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, she amazing. did it completely like by ear. Yeah, because she's sweet. an American girl. She can she do would, that though. She she's can do anything. <laughs> she's. I think she's the greatest singer of our generation. Yeah, she's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. What do you have? Oh, um, I'm just blown away about all the people you've worked with and yeah. met. Um, I wanted. To, I wanted to ask you the um the first because when you was mentioning when you when you got your first gig at the um, the studio and the guy with the slick Rick and Oh, Achille Walker at Ralston. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to know like who was the first, first um the first artist or group that you've mixed, like the very first. It, that's kind of hard to pinpoint. Huh? I don't think so. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, it, it wasn't a group. I mean, I think that the very the very first record was "Ain't Nothing Going On But the Rent" with yeah, Gwen okay. Guthrie, which was in 1986, and then that was followed by "Only in My Dreams," which was basically a demo. I mean, the basically what. I think what happened was they had also, at the same time they'd hired Fred to do the main version, they hired little Louis Vega to do a 12-inch of the same record. Okay. And the 12-inch, I think they started promoting in Miami, and they just started working its way up. So like four months later, it was already like a number one 12-inch. But they hadn't released a radio single, and in those days you had to kind of like jump on it super fast. So Atlantic Records still had a vault on 63rd Street where the studios were and where all the mastering uh, rooms were. So my dad was somewhere in the Atlantic vault of the demo that I had mixed for Fred. Wow. And it was the only mix of Only In My Dreams that had ever been done. And so they just took my dad and mastered exactly. it. And that's it. I mean, it's the record up there. You that's know? crazy. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, those were those were really like the first two, um, you know, chart, chart records. I mean, there probably were other records that I had maybe worked on in an engineering capacity before I kind of, I don't know. I, I hadn't really set out to come to New York to become a mixer. I just kind of, I just wanted to be involved. I just wow. wanted to be in the game somehow, you know. Yeah. And I think it just turned out that I, I, I have a certain kind of ability as a musician ability to, to be able to like blend things and mix things. Yeah. I wish I could do that. <laughs> well, you need I to come wish. to my seminar, I mean, man. I can I teach you how to do it. Speaking of seminar, what what what's what's this seminar thing like? What what are you doing exactly, and how can people? Well, get I to mean, um, basically the the original seminar I did with Ryan West. You know, the guy's done all the Eminem stuff. He's yeah. a is a really old friend of mine, colleague, and we were actually on a remix hotel at SAE with Hank Shockley and a couple other producers. I think okay. Just Blaze was there, and Ryan was there, and I was there, and Ryan and I. I graduated was, from SAE. Oh, okay, yeah. So this was. This was like four and a half years ago, right? So this okay. is 2010. Already the music business has crashed, right, in 2007, and the record stores have all closed, 80% of the studios have closed. And so, you know, Ryan and I were talking about how, you know, like pretty much everybody that cut their teeth in the music business learned from somebody else. You yeah. know, like in my case, I mean, I assisted for Chris Lord Algae at Unique. I assisted for Andy Wallace, who did Nirvana at, um, at Soundtrack. But this was before he did Nevermind. You know, this was way before he he really like hit it. He was still doing like Tina Turner remixes and Natalie. He was doing dance records basically and R and B records. Wow. But um, but I mean, I learned a tremendous amount just standing behind those guys. And so I said to Ryan, you know, like we should really we should try to do something like that. You know, we should try to like mix in front of people and show them what we're doing. And I kind of conceived the idea of elements of mixing, sort of basically taking. You know, like what I, um, like you were talking about my daily routine. You know, well, I mean, part of my daily routine in some cases is starting a mix from scratch with the expectation that after after eight hours or something, I'm going to deliver something that's very, very close to the final master, maybe with some revisions and some changes. Yeah. But basically very, very close to, you know, like the rough cut of a film, you know. Like yeah. I can I could deliver that like within a day, within seven or eight hours. And, like, and so I tried to kind of examine, well, what do I do? And where do I start? 
Okay. And so I tried to basically break up my whole um, my whole mix philosophy, which you know I've been doing ever since I started mixing. It's been changing over the years, and obviously with the advent of Pro Tools and digital audio and plugins and all that stuff, it's it's changed a lot. Oh, yeah. It used to be Hold about on. patching in pieces of outboard gear and, and, I learned how and to doing patch. your and Hold yeah on. you know and doing your and doing your moves you know Fader with like VCAs and... on on consoles you yeah. know. So I just sort of like everybody else who's who's you know moved from the analog world into the digital world just adopted all of those techniques it doesn't really matter what platform you're mixing on you be mixing on a 16 channel Mackie you could be mixing on an iPad in yeah. garage band you're mixing is you're just blending things it's just level EQ it can balance com compression up. panning these are all the things that I call the elements of mixing okay you know saturation parallel compression you know like all of the things that you that you do to a record either to add excitement to it or to bring out the emotion of what's going on with the singer or to bring out you know some some kind of hooky element yeah. you know that 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 people are going to gravitate to okay. and so um and so what i do basically in the class is i kind of go through my process you know and i do it you know and, and i try to explain all along the way this is why i'm doing this you know yeah, this is okay. why i'm doing this and a lot of it is um, is very difficult to teach. I think at the university level because you know a song is different every day. Yeah, it, it really be. is. I mean, even uh, even on the same record, you know, between track two and track three, like one can be super easy and the other yeah. can be a complete nightmare that takes weeks. And there's just no explanation for why that is, other than the anomaly of sort of the dark science of what music mixing is. Mm -hmm. Which is that you're always kind of you always have to kind of think outside the box in terms of like, you know, well, mixers are often put in the position of having to save a song. You okay. know what I mean? Like there's something going on, but the producer hasn't quite brought it to the place where it's just holding together as a rough mix. It actually needs a certain amount of finesse and a certain amount of massaging to get it to a place where people go, "Whoa, I love that. That's a great record," as opposed to, "Eh, that's an okay record." And the mix can actually sell the record in in the long run, yeah. And get it across the threshold, you know, to the A and R guys and the radio people and marketing people, you know. Sometimes a hot mix, even if the artist isn't so great, you know, can get it going, which is your job. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to say that we're professional turd polishers or anything, but I mean there is there is always an aspect of that. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of artists out right now that need that mixing. That, like that, need it that only that I mean that they have great mixing and it that as an artist Chief they're shitty no I think I think the mixing could even help them in yeah. their shitty vocals I right. mean you think about some of the artists that are right now that just are straight up trash yeah I mean can we play they, we have submissions we do submissions on the show can we play you some stuff yeah of and course you can, yeah. you can give them a good critique on it Absolutely, oh, yeah, cool. sure. So, uh, how can people get into the segment, the mixing segment? Yeah, oh, it's elements elements of mixing dot com. Elements of mixing dot com. Yeah, and it's usually the 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 live events are are posted um, usually about two weeks before it actually happens. Probably so the next one will be about like second week in June, probably. Okay. But um, you know, like I I do public appearances too. I'm doing one at Guitar Center on 14th Street, the 20th of May. Nice. And uh, it's just a teaser. It's like an hour and a half. You know, I'm just going to kind of show just like just a real quick, broad overview of what I do in the, in the seminars, which are longer. They're five or six hours long. It's very intense. It's like wow. an all day thing. But, um, you know, I mean, I'm also in the plans of trying to put together basically an elements of mixing library of of instructional videos, which will probably be an app more nice. than a web based thing. Yeah. So you said uh, you had the iSinger app. I was wondering if that I was, was yeah I mean I was I was um that's something that I was messing with probably um I'd say 4 or 5 years ago and it was really just um that I thought that there there's got to be a better way of discovering talent than American Idol you know which is basically a kind of a performance based karaoke you yeah. know reality show which is really not about music per se it's certainly not about the deep stuff you know I mean the job that record companies did is being filters and like finding talent or discovering talent and then exploiting the talent and putting it out there in front of people so that they can hear it you know they're still doing but they're doing it in such a narrow way you know that a lot of stuff just either falls through the cracks or ends up getting picked up by startup independent labels you know 
So the idea behind Night <laughs> Singer is that you know people could um, they could upload a cappellas or they could upload a track of their song, and then there would be like a voting scheme that ran on the app, and people could vote it up to the top. And you know, I mean, to some extent, I mean that's sort of been picked up by Indaba and other country, uh, other you know, big websites that are doing contest kind of things. Okay. I still don't think that anybody's done it quite the way I wanted to do it with iSinger, but it it's you know, that's just another game, you know. I mean I had spent, you know, about twenty five grand. I had I had iSinger, I Rapper and I Riffer, which were three different apps for three different kind of genres. One was for wow. singers, one was for guitar slingers and one was for rappers. And I thought that that would be a great way for people not only to network with each other and find one another all over the world, but it would ultimately the cream would rise to the top, and you Definitely, would you would yeah. find great artists, and then and then ultimately there would be kind of some kind of sell through to the labels. But it would have cost me so much money to keep it on top of the stack in iTunes that I, I ultimately just kind of went back to doing what I was doing, which was mixing and producing records. I mean, I didn't give up on it, but I just didn't have I didn't have the capital to market it myself. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean, without venture capital and without like lots of advertising and marketing, nobody ever finds your app. Yeah. You know, there's a billion apps. There were already a billion apps four or five years ago when I launched. So, you know, I mean, I did a Facebook campaign. I created, you know, it's... But again, you know, it's like the whole DIY thing. You know, like artists being stuck trying to be marketing and salespeople for their own material, I just think is is really it's counter... Crazy. It's counterintuitive. I mean, I've never met anybody who I respected who was a salesman. Now, Puffy's a salesman. <laughs> You know, I mean, Puffy can sell anything, you know, yeah. he could sell ice to Eskimos, you know, digital chocolate, you know, like that's what he was talking about. <laughs> Sexual chocolate, right? You know, back in the Clive Davis era. I mean, Puffy was just really good at getting people excited about music, you know, and I mean, yeah. some artists are naturally inclined that way, you know, Gaga is kind of inclined that way. Um, Amanda Palmer is kind of inclined that way. I mean, they like to reach out, they like to communicate, yeah. they like to build up you know, enthusiasm around what they're doing. Yeah. But I think it's quite rare, actually, you know? I mean, just from my own experience, the artists that I've worked with, you know, I mean, they would really rather put needles in their eyes than get online one more time and post another thing. What do you guys think about what I'm writing? You know, it's yeah, like, they I, just, it's so, it's so narcissistic and it's completely contrary <laughs> to what artists are about. Yeah. Artists just want to be in their cave, make their shit, and have people hear it and like it and hear about it. They don't want to tell everybody how business. great they are. And, like, nobody who I've ever worked with wants to do that. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, there there are guys that are quite self-aggrandizing, like Kanye. But I think that Kanye <laughs> is a product of this narcissistic social revolution that we're in the midst of. Yeah. He's but the, he doesn't even promote his stuff anymore like that. Yeah. he's He's ran away from all that. Yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, I mean, maybe he did it because he felt that that's what he needed to do, you know, to get the pole position, and then maybe pulled back from it because he realized that that's not who he is as an artist, you know? Yeah. I mean, when I worked with Kanye, he was a beat maker for Jay-Z, and, you know, like Get By with Tlaib, you know, was with Kanye's track. Yeah. And he was ostensibly a beat maker, you know? It was, it was after he had the car accident, he was writing that through the wire stuff. Yeah, in the hospital bed that he actually made the transition from beat maker to well that song put him art. over yeah that that song I think was the transition song for him as Definitely. an artist but I just don't think that I mean I actually just think that those those things should be separated I think that sales and marketing people should do sales and I think that artists should be artists and this whole DIY revolution of like well you gotta tweet a hundred times a day and you gotta do this <laughs> and you gotta tell people what you're up to all the time and what food you're eating and when you go to the bathroom and <laughs> It's just insane, you know. It makes that's no sense. it's it's and it's not because I'm old fashioned, you know. It's it's because I don't think that that's part of the artist's journey. It's not. It's not. It's, not. it's not. it's not. It's not for anybody. It's not for. I mean, like you know, Biggie was not a big social person. He did like almost <laughs> nobody came to the studio with him. You know, he came to the room. He sat down. He twisted up a blunt. He got something to eat, and he just sat for hours until he got it together in his head and then he went to the microphone and he did it yeah. he did it in solitude like the Beatles did for you know 10 years they never had any visitors at Abbey Road George Martin wouldn't allow visitors wow. the first visitor was Yoko Ono in 1968 and the band broke up Yoko a year later Yoko Ono <laughs> is 
fucking crazy. <laughs> she's, she's the she's fucking the cause nut. of it all. She's I, I actually, I, I actually have, uh, I've seen quite a few interviews with George Harrison and Paul McCartney where they said Yoko had nothing to do with it. The band was ready to, <laughs> they were, they were ready to part. They, they yeah. were fighting so badly with each other at that point. You know, they just had had it. No, I didn't think she was like the cause of it. She wasn't the she cause. Was, she wasn't the but cause. Of it. She but I mean, it was definitely was a pain in the ass that like these guys were lads that had grown up together and they were used to being in a room alone, and now yeah. there was this bitch sitting on the Fender <laughs> Reverb, like next to John, like every day, all day in the studio. You know, it's like it's one thing for your girlfriend to pop in; it's another thing for your girlfriend to be there every day while you're trying to make a <laughs> record. You know, yeah, yeah. So I don't know about that, but that's cool. I don't know. So we're gonna take a break, and we can can we we can pull up some tracks from. The, from yeah, do you want to record that or? Huh? Yeah, we definitely could record. I I would like to let them get your feedback on on the record. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, just plug right in here. All right, cool. Yo, it's your boy Cram again. Another week of podcasting. Oh man, this shit is fun. Loving and chilling with my guys here. Yo, you can check us on Stitcher. We out there for the Android family now. iPhones, crazy iTunes everywhere at theformalities.com. If you got some shit you want to hear, send it to us, player. Info at theformalities.com. Info at theformalities.com. One love. So we're about to hear the submission. And we're going to get right into it. Play, play a glimpse. Okay, the first one is from Stace Music. Stace? From Stace, yeah. Artist called Stace. Okay. Um, this track is entitled Little Bit Better. All right. Wow. What do you think of that? Wow. Honest opinion. Honest opinion. Uh, I, uh, hold on one sec. I love it. I love it. It reminds me of so many things. I mean, actually, I was in a band in the 90s called Brooklyn Funk Essentials. And, uh, and you know, we were doing like acid jazz, you know, which was yeah. basically like a live extension of what Tribe Called Quest was doing with samples. We were like a live band that was doing that. Okay. And there were there were other bands, you know, like Groove Collective and Wax Poetic that were all part of this like giant step scene that was happening on Union Square at Metropolitan in the basement. They were having like a DJ with like saxophone players and trumpet players. I was one of the trumpet players. Yeah. Jay Rodriguez, Josh Roseman, all these guys, you know, it was like it reminds me very much of like the kind of early nineties, like ninety three, ninety four, like acid jazz scene yeah. in New York and acid jazz scene in London. But I mean there's just shades of, of so much in that, you know? Like Tribe Called Quest, D'Angelo, you know, a lot of uh a lot of familiar a lot of familiar, familiar stu sound. stuff in that sound. And I think sonically it's it's quite nice, you know? Cool. It's quite quite well presented. Are these guys uh, are these guys well known? Are they just getting uh, started? Stace music. He's I think he's I think he's well known. He sent us some tracks before. Mm -hmm. So I told him we we're gonna interview you today. So he sent over this one just to see <laughs> what you say. I like it. I like it a lot. It's beautiful. I like it. I like it too. It's, it's real mellow. Yeah, it was a really good one. I mean, it really feels like music. it really feels like a jazz hip hop throwback yeah. thing. You know, yeah. which I mean, it, in the in a sense, like that genre. 
I mean, it was so crazy today. I was in Best Buy, you know, getting this thing for my iPhone, you know, yeah. the little uh, char Mofi. charger yeah, thing. Mofi. And they were busting out the 90s hip hop. Like, they played <laughs> Doing It Well, like, in the middle of, like, you know, yeah. the, the boombox department, like, right next to the mobile <laughs> department. It was, like, blasting through Best Buy on 14th Street, you know? And it's like, and, like, right before that, it was, like, Naughty by Nature, you know? Like, yeah. that whole, whole era of stuff. I mean, it just shows, I mean, with this guy or with anybody, like, how much hip hop is influenced by jazz. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So you got one more. Okay, so what's next? This is Osho P P I don't want to mess up your name, but Oso Piscasso? Oso Piscasso? Something like that, yeah. Okay. Track is entitled Wind. Alright. Rebel Posse. FBM. Tree Home. Home front. Shout out to my team, man. Uh, my check one two one two, yeah. My check one two one two. This is my skate flow. Push we ride in the streets, swerving like beliefs. Sub a virgin that's urban government lurking, yep. Yeah. Looking for societies, ask up these varieties. Hit it within the hippies and Macon, cause they keep buying me. This set is more to life, good times is old fashioned, like not fat, just giving dap. While laughing and slow rapping, inside is all alike, cause they don't care to listen. But my posse stand out, cause we dare to be different. So break it down, roll it up, resemble all the properties and non exist the world. Close people with no poverty, take a trip, just take a look, don't be shook. Pearling the good one, friend of papers in the book. That's just me smoking my knowledge, you're trying to make profit So when I close my eyelids, I'm doing a perfect college You're chilling at the parties, signing tips to sharpen You should watch the thing you say, cause I will call it in Cardi, I got my billionaire dreams Feeling the summer breeze, break them down to their knees Run my city till it can breathe Enlightenment to your mind, to receive what's been deceived An everlasting dream, never let the soul grieve And now I'm just keeping calm with open palms like everything was free Just staying cool like the breeze in the palm tree I've been selected to keep protected Buddha's everlasting message that will leave them I was just listening to this like Mad Libs compilation that they put out on SoundCloud. It was like yeah. ten years of Mad Libs all like, you know, in one set. Some DJ had like gone and found like I mean his shit was so insane. It's very it reminds me very much of sort of like the British soul scene. Okay. You know, like acid jazz records. Like there were like a lot of like grime kind of thing? Yeah. There were just a lot of bands, you know, at at that time. I mean the brand new heavies was like the most like popular because India Davenport had had put out a couple songs that were, you know, like uh, Dream Come True was more like a kind of a pop record. But fundamentally, like, those guys were just groove guys. Yeah. You know? I mean, the bass player was sick with that band. I don't know. It's it's like, it's, I think that that's, that's kind of like a timeless genre, the sort of like, that sort of like, that groovy jazz thing. Jazz. It, are you playing this because you feel like this is trending right now? That this no, is coming this back? No, this is just this sent is, to me. I, I, sent, I sent out a, a tweet and people sent in their tracks. It's just and interesting it because like, if you listen to that track and you listen to the track before it, there's like the, there's yeah, definitely like a... Pretty correlated. It's, there's it's a, different, they're both yeah. kind of the same, like... same, but they're, they're, kind of they're, they're different. different this, is, this is, yeah, this is more of like on sort of like the jump, jazzy kind of yeah. Q-tip sort of thing. And then the previous one was much more sort of, I don't know, like... Down tempo, jazzy kind of thing. Are those the only two things that you brought today? Um, I have another one, but it's a YouTube video, so I don't know if I can pull it up here. Okay, so this last track is by Dunzo Dave. Oh, okay. Dunzo, yeah, Dunzo. yeah, Dunzo Dave. Sorry, I keep saying Dunzo. Word. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's from Dunzo Dave. It's called um, White People, White People Selling Food. Okay. <laughs> oh, white people Spanish food. White, yeah, Spanish. White people selling, white people Spanish, selling people Spanish people food. Spanish people food. White people selling Spanish people food. That's, That's definitely a like New York song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is it. Okay. We got a white people selling. We got a Spanish people selling. We got a white people selling, selling, selling. Wow, 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 wow. Uh. Yeah, my name is Dave, I've never been afraid I started rapping when I heard that renegade Ever since that day, I think that's when I've been a slave For this rap shit, now it's action when I'm hitting play Get it, A, listen, A, cooking in that kitchen, A Sitting back, I'm just reclining, eating chicken ramen I buy my bitches diamonds, we don't got things in common 
We don't buy things in bulk. We put that shit in plastic. The shit I do is drastic. We bout it if you ask it. We bout it, you just act it. Now, matter of fact, you cast it. They say I sound like action. Nah, man, I sound like killer. Ghost face. Matter of fact, I sound like killer. Can't run. That's why I got this pink on with them damn Tims with that motherfucking mink on. That's right, I'm trying to get my pimp on. I was on main nav in a strip, you know. We them dudes, I be talking all the shit, you know. We saying all the shit, but we the shit, you know. Live from the bottom of the pit, you know. Bump YG before I hit the dough. Got that shit from my bitch, you know. Seen a really thick chick with a slick whip. Be like, who you been with? Who you kiss with? You know what? I don't wanna know. Oh. We're getting okay. a lot of this jazz feel. Yeah, kind of yeah. jazz. Everybody, that's, 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 like that's, that's, that's funny how we getting that. That was like, almost kind of like cream, like blues funk from the that, 60s I, or something. No, no, no that does all day. I go. That was definitely a dope track. Yeah, I think that that kind of like he's definitely like a comer. You know, like any rapper who's on the way up is always talking about how fucked up and dumb other rappers are. You know, and that's it's so like it's ancient. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that the rap battle is probably thousands of years old. Yeah, There's been, always been other guys that have been trying to intellectually take down other guys on the stage, you know, and Eminem in his, in his day and age was undefeated. Oh, oh, yeah. Like, nobody in Detroit ever beat him. Like, he just sent guys, like, you know, with their head in their hands, like, down off the stage because he <laughs> crushed them intellectually. He just couldn't... Oh, yeah. Nobody had his imagination and his quickness in the freelance game you know yeah. this guy's definitely got character he's definitely talking about Macklemore you know he's not really on Eminem's dick because he's like he's more like <laughs> he's more like an old school rapper right yeah. he's more like a guy just yeah. rapping over a beat in the 80s or something it's uh-huh. cool I really I really like Dave nice. Dave's got he's got character he's got personality he's got a he has a know, unique voice he has like a unique voice, he has still. a unique voice and his stuff is his beats are grimy they're certified definitely definitely yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be very, very interested to hear more from him, to hear, like, what he has to say, because I think he's probably got a lot to say. Cool. And this song almost kind of sounds like a, an advertisement for him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's I mean, early, the, it's the video looks early, like he's doing it live in the video. He's like, probably doing it live. I think yeah. it was. It, it, on the word, it's, it said live. There's a lot of amazing live performance shit that's getting produced. Yeah that's happening on YouTube now. Like, kids are figuring out how to plug the shit into, like, a board and then stick that into the feed. So, like, when they hit the beat, it's not, like, some 8-bit camera audio. It's, like, the real deal. Yeah. I don't know whether that's the case with that, but, yeah. Uh, He's good. Well, we're supposed to be having him on the show. supposed to be coming on the show soon, so. Soon, so hopefully. Well, if you want to do the Dave show here, you're welcome to. (laughs) I'd love to meet Dave, (laughs) you know. (laughs) That would be... uh, Uh, Thank you, Bob, for... For letting us come here and use your studio to record and everything else. Oh, it's my pleasure. Oh, yeah, definitely appreciate it's so, it. It's yeah. so great to have you guys here, man. I, I hope to see more of you in the future. Enjoy definitely. hearing your stories. It's very interesting. Your stories were I'm, definitely I'm, like, very breathtaking. Organic. I was. I wasn't even thought of yeah. the years <laughs> when you were doing this stuff. I think yeah, you hadn't. The thought hadn't even been spoken of you. <laughs> no, at that point. not even. Yeah. Not even a little bit. <laughs> well, the, you know, the crazy thing is that like most of the people that I work with are people like you know who weren't even born when I started my career. You know, that's how, I wasn't. That's how fucking old I am. You know? <laughs> but it's weird. I don't feel old. Like, all the people that I work with are in their, their early 20s or their mid-20s. And you, don't, just... you don't appear old. You don't come off old. Okay. So I'm not trying yeah. to be old, ever, <laughs> <laughs> if I can avoid it. How can all the people find your stuff and get, get, get in touch with uh, you? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, Basie Bob on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, that's probably the easiest way, or basebob.com. But I, that, that's more of just kind of like a discography site. It's not. I yeah. don't really mind my website. I spend more time on the, you know, probably like Facebook and and, and Twitter, and Twitter. Or where I spend nice. most. So basebob on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, at, at, and it's also at basebob. Basy B A S S Y B O B on uh, Instagram. Where actually I probably spend more time than Facebook these days. I don't really. I only spend time on Facebook if I'm promoting an event, which I do do with some regularity, but I use it more as a tool. It used to be part of my 
daily routine, and now it's not. Are yeah. you certified? Certified as far as what? <laughs> on, on these accounts. You know, you got to get that oh, blue, verified. Yeah, verified. <laughs> you got to get verified. You got to get verified. We got we to gotta get you verified, man. I don't think I'm verified anywhere in the social media world, but if you want to verify me, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, it, it, puts you, it puts you on this, the map as like um, a celebrity, right? Nah, it's just basically saying that you're basic Bob. You're Nobody someone to, take your identity. you know. Oh, that I am, that I am. The this, one and the, only. You are the one. The well, one I guess that's only. because people do, people do copycat sites for, oh, yeah, for yeah, stars. Like, fan clubs yeah, yeah. like hundreds yeah. of them, right? So many parodies out there. Well, not just parodies, but I mean like fan clubs too. Mm-hmm. Like people that want to what? take the yeah. Twitter account oh, of yeah. the, you know, or, or match the followers of the person that they are mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah, that's inter- That's a whole interesting phenomenon. It's sort of like people jumping on other people's other stuff. people's stuff like what? I mean it's it's a thing um my friend Attila he's going through a battle right now he put his his mixtape up on SoundCloud and another guy has a SoundCloud his his name is Attila X he has another SoundCloud Attila X2 or something and he just puts up his own, he puts he put up his music saying that he's him re-upload it <laughs> Re-upload the same Just file. Just re-upload and, and, the same file and impersonate and impersonated the... him. And he got <laughs> and this guy, but this guy gets put not not the guy who made the track, the imposter gets put on a blog. The blog gets thousands of hits. It's crazy. It's crazy. That's wild. It's the wild wild, wild west of the internet. Yeah, it's the the wild internet. West. There's no law. There's definitely no. There's law no law so in the much. HTML world, man. It's like. <laughs> But you know the law is coming. Yeah. Just like you know, there was no law in the Wild West when there were gold prospectors. If somebody like came and tried to dig in your dirt, you just shoot him in the head. And that was it. <laughs> you know. The internet's kind of like that. Yeah. You know? It's 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 pretty. Uh, it's still pretty raw, com- considering how commercial it is, and how how deeply embedded corporations are into it. It's still finding its way. Yeah. I think that social media is incredibly naive and and young. It's still young. It's, it's, ju- still it's, it's young. kind of juvenile in a way. It's oh kind of it's kind of like when, you know, boys start looking at their dick and girls start looking at themselves in the mirror when you're like 13. You know, like, look at me. You know, and but that's how adults are behaving on the internet. That's how everybody's. It's how oh, yeah. corporations are behaving. Everybody's about me, me, me. When I think that t- truly the power of the internet is is so vast and extraordinary people don't even realize it which is the idea of tribes you can have tribes of millions of people around a belief structure like saving the earth or Uh, whatever that has nothing to do with race or age or sex or class or any of the distinctions that normally rule our day-to-day life in the brick and mortar world you know like you're black you're asian you're from a rich family you're a girl therefore you don't get paid as much (laughs) you know in the internet world that won't necessarily be the case you're all people who believe in the same meme Mm -hmm. yeah and if people start aligning around that then ultimately national boundaries disappear and we're just a global society and i think the faster that happens the better because it's really you know it's corporation it's corporations and and nation states that are really fucking shit up right now in the world oh yeah I they agree. need to be put down like like rabid dogs. <laughs> it needs to be replaced by the tribe of elders. <laughs> well, thank you, Basie. Yeah, yeah, your history and everything. Yeah, it was a pleasure, man. It's been yeah, a my great. pleasure, man. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Awesome. <laughs> hey, thank you. come back again soon. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Peace. Peace out.